Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for coming on here, man. I appreciate it. You and I have uh, been in the same unit a couple of times, and uh, we've interacted a, a lot when you were down at SOCOM, when I, when uh, Dreyer and I used to come down there and talk about JTAC program stuff. And uh, I, the one thing I remember about you, um, not the one thing, but the thing that sticks out when I think about you is your professionalism. Like you were always so squared away. It was really impressive. I think you set a good example for the guys you serve with. Yeah, so um, I was reading through your bio, and like I told you before we got on here, you know, you and I have, we, we interacted many times. We, you know, we're in the same unit. We've talked many times, and I, there, half of the stuff I didn't even know. So I am so excited to get into, into this stuff, um, especially like, because you have a unique uh, beginning where, uh, you know, most of us grew up in the States, but you had a unique beginning of growing up in Puerto Rico. So tell me about that. Tell me about, let's start in Puerto Rico. Let's start where you grew up and then we'll go from there. Tell me how you got in the military. Sure. First and foremost, thank you for having me on the show. Um, I've went through some, I, I did actually, I didn't find out about your, about your podcast and not too long ago. And I started going through a few and, uh, it was, it was very impressive. Like, like you're just alluding to it right now that, um, you know people for years and you have like no idea the things that they've actually done. <laughs> right. Their career is very incredibly interesting. And you have some interesting uh, pipe hitters uh, in the show. For sure. Uh, and it's it's an honor actually to 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 be able to share a little bit of, um, of my story. So um, so to, to your question, um, Puerto Rico. So so I was born, born in Puerto Rico and um, um, very shortly when I was very, very little, um, there used to be an Air Force base there. Um, it's called Ramey Air Force Base, and uh, that place closed down in the seventies. And so, when that happened, um, they basically sold the base housing as low income housing. So at the time, it was kind of a kind of a good deal. Yeah. Um, um, so a lot of young families uh, moved there. And one part of it, the Coast Guard took over, and like, but the vast majority of the base was actually. Uh, um, um, civilianized, if you will. Okay. Um, one of the interesting things about that place, um, it's ha it has a long history. The base was open in the thirties and in the forties, it became part of strategic air command. And oddly enough, reading throughout the history later on in life, I found out that one of the units, the, one of the last units that was there was called the 24th composite wing. And, uh, the 24th composite wing is essentially the lineage of the 24th SDS. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the unique things about living in that place was that everybody, all the kids that lived there were within 10 years of each other. Okay. So everybody knew each other. Everybody hung out, everybody. It was, it was a very unusual place, but cool in a lot of ways. And no, nobody followed the traditional thing you think of, oh, Puerto Rico. So probably everybody played baseball and <laughs> basketball and whatever. The reality was that most people there um, either surfed or skateboarded. Really? Yeah. And I, uh, I, I did both, but mostly skateboarded. Okay. Um, you, you, you talk about me being squared away and everything, but literally at the time I had a, I had a undercut long hair blonde. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was wild. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I lived there for about 10 years or so. And that also, by the way, on the same street that I lived in, I actually met who is my, my wife now. Oh, right on. Yeah. So we, we met when we were little. Wow. So. So after a while, after a certain amount of years, 10 years, 10, 12 years or so, I moved to San Juan and then I moved to Arecibo and that's really where I graduated high school. Um, when I moved to Arecibo, I met my next, I, I, did really, I was just a, skate, a skateboard kid, you know? So yeah. I, I had no direction, no nothing. And I met my next door neighbor and he was in, uh, um, he was in Civil Air Patrol. Okay. And uh, I, in the state, Civil Air Patrol is, some something like junior ROTC in schools, but in Puerto Rico, uh, Civil Air Patrol is essentially a search and rescue thing. Oh wow! Yeah, you work directly with like the American Red Cross and you know and, and civil defense and whatever, and because of all the you know all, all, all the all the hurricanes and sure. so. Like that. so um, I met this guy and um, we became friends. We became re we've been friends well, for till this day. Um, so. He, he kind of brought me in. He goes, hey, you know, kind of check this out. So I did. I kind of liked it. And I stuck with it. And uh, everybody pretty much leaving our uh, uh, Civil Air Patrol went, was going to go to the Army or whatever the case may be. And uh, and then I took my, you know, I took the aspect. I go, hey, Air Force. And 
my mother, my mother clearly wanted me to go in the Air Force route, right? <laughs> right. So I, uh, so I did that, but I, I, I sort of, um, um, long story short, I kind of ended up passing basic and then I went to, to tech school and became a supply guy. And I, I knew right off the gate that that wasn't the thing I wanted to do. But you know, you, you kind of make lemonade, right? And, uh, but before I left to go, in, to go into the military, um, um, some people that had already been in the military earlier, like in the 80s and you know, post-Vietnam, that kind of thing, they said, you know, um, it's going to be tough for you to be Hispanic and being in the Air Force. The expectation is you're going to be at the lower tier. So you have to like try to outperform everyone. So, um, so I went to the squadron, I, I put my best foot forward and, um, aside from doing, um, supply stuff, um, I was volunteering for like every TDY that was out there. And I went to like, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia was my first trip to the desert, uh, with a supply guy. And one of the first things that, uh, led me to the, how the world kind of works is, um, I, we were in a traffic jam and in the very few times in a year that, uh, that it rains, mm-hmm. it started raining. So we were part, so we were in a traffic jam and the vehicle in front of us was pickup and the pickup in the back had a goat and, uh, the driver and his wife got out of the pickup and believe it or not, they took the goat out, put the goat inside the vehicle and had the wife sit in the back. Seat. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It was kind of wild. Yeah. But um, I also did a couple of other TDYs, and 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 two of them in particular um, uh, that's that's that stand out because it was outside of the the wheelhouse of being um, of being a supply guy was uh, I worked as a as a linguist also. So uh, my first trip in the '90s, you may or may not remember this, but there was this huge influx of Cuban migrants. That it was kind of like the Muriel thing in the '80s. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, okay, yep. So they pretty much picked everybody up from the water, right? And they, they had no place to put them, so they put them all in Guantanamo Bay. So they established this joint task force and and what have you, and uh, and I kind of went there as a linguist. Wow. And, oh, by the way, this is where all those like Camp Alpha, Camp Golf, and more importantly, Camp X-Ray. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was actually established. Um, so I did about six months there. Uh, it was my first time working in a true joint JTF yeah, yeah. environment. Um, and I worked in a hospital and I also worked uh, out in the field. Um, and I did a lot of time on the ER and, uh, I was essentially, um, the, the, the oddities about, about that kind of situation is that you don't know those people were all living together, but you don't know if this guy was a doctor and the guy next to him was an assassin. Like, sure. You literally didn't know. And some people would come in with stab, you know, stab wounds and, you know, maybe you would shift and stuff like that and and I, I had to sit through operations and stuff like that which wow, was very man. interesting yeah so uh so i come back from that and then i a few months later i turn around and they uh they pick me up for something called project dominant chronicle and it's uh it's a defense intelligence agency and uh and fbi and and dea um uh, operation that basically they were doing document exploitation from operations in South America. Okay. So, um, so pretty much all the country teams were gathering information. This is everything from, you know, from the time of, you know, that well, all the drug cartels were getting busted down and people were getting, uh, getting rolled up. So there was a lot of documentations and things that were coming in. And unlike in the U S like those guys stayed in prison until the, until they gradually confirmed the case in court. Right. Right which meant that we were had to translate all these documents and everything. And, and then we had to like back brief essentially the government agencies and what we were finding oh, okay. based on the guidance given to us. And uh, so it was essentially the same thing as my last trip where it was like a motley crew of different people picked from, uh, from all the services. And uh, so one of the guys that came over that was working right next to me was, uh, was a guy named John Mendes. Yeah. So John Mendes and I, John Mendes wanted to go pararescue and I, and, um, and I said, Hey man, I'm kind of like thinking doing something a little bit different. And, uh, I probably should have said this before. So between those two trips, um, I had already was thinking about, I want to get out of the air force and like go to the army. Cause that was really more of the kind of thing I like. Sure. And, and I was stationed at Eglin. So I was on the, you know, you, you could go to the ranger camp and whatever. So they had this little, um, uh, 4th of July or open house or something. And you, you know, they did the little demos and stuff. I'm like, yeah, I kind of want to do that. Right. Right. 
So, so I was, uh, so I was getting, get, gonna get out and, uh, between those two trips, um, I went to take a clip. And when I went to take a clip for those who don't, for those in the audience of the clip is essentially, a, a you take an exam and if you pass the exam, you, you, you literally, you know, you, you pass the class. So I went to take an exam and then I saw this old crusty guy for the life of me. I can't remember who it was. And, uh, he had a, he had a black beret. He had air force strikes and had a combat patch. And I was like, wow, what, <laughs> what's that? And I go, Hey, what, uh, you don't mind me. Are you working at the ranger camp or what? He goes, Oh no, no, we're in tac P. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So you, you do stuff with the army. You're still air force. You blow things up and you jump out of airplanes. Yeah, pretty much. All right, I'm I'm sold. That's <laughs> so old, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so fast forward to DC, and in DC, I, I you know I told I told Johnny, I said, hey man, like you know, uh, pararescue thing looks cool, but you know, I'm, I'm I'm doing this. So you know, so we we kind of stayed in touch throughout the time or whatever. And uh, later on, I, I found him. He was actually the class after mine. Oh, okay. In Texas. So eventually, I put in my package to cross train, and uh, when when my when I finally got a, a slot. So apparently there was like a lot of, there was literally no cross training slots. And then all of a sudden there was like three or four or five or six or whatever. Right. Right. So I went to my, so I, so I, I got a slot and, uh, I don't know about two weeks after I found out that I had a slot, somebody calls me up at work and it was, he goes, Hey, I'm staff Sergeant Brandenburg and I'm going to be, I'm going to go to your class and you know, he was, he was a hard charger from even, even from before he called you before you guys even went to school. Yeah. Wow. Right. I, I actually, I actually met him on the phone uh, before we even even saw each other. How about that? Speaking yeah. of squared away guys, I mean, yeah, that, that sounds like him trying to get all his yeah. ducks in a row. He was probably like, was he the class leader at that time? He was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sounds about right. So, like my class, I think if I remember right, and, and I think our class was like twenty one people, but we lost like seven. Okay. We ended up like fourteen people, and. Some of the guys that came out of that class, Brandy, um, Alan Hawk was in my class, and um, um, uh, Aki. Okay, yeah. Stephen Aki was in my class. Um, but yeah, so um, so yeah, so we we gra- we we you know we were we cross trained, we we passed, <laughs> right. and uh, so we all kind of had already because we were cross trainees, we we weren't really into like the airborne program or anything. We already we all had like assignments. Sure. Leading. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Alan Hawk was a radio maintenance guy. He was just going to go back to where he was at, and uh, I think I think he was at Campbell, and then he went to JCE or something. Okay. And then Brandy went to went to Shaw, and then I I went to Fort Benning. Right, right. And that's where we met. Right. Yeah. Right. So uh, so coming out of the coming out of the regular Air Force and going into this job, um, um, it was uh, well, you remember it was uh, it was it was a very very odd. School squadron yeah because uh one flight was supporting mechanized infantry and another flight was supporting the rangers and we i don't remember having animosity like nobody really had animosity per se i don't think so no but i but i but i do remember like the the characters the, you <laughs> right. know, like, like i remember the, like the, the people there yeah. and, uh, so i work with uh the guy uh I, I, and i don't want to i'm not gonna name drop back but, you know whatever sure but, sure I used to work for this guy that um um he 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 was he was an odd, he was an upper great guy. So a couple of the guy, you know, I was with the airman. I was still a senior airman at the time, and um, so a lot of guys used to like make fun, like do things because the guy was a little paranoid. Mm. I, I I think you I think you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. And uh, so he bought a ho- I remember he bought a hockey stick, and uh, he was a he was from New York. He had, yeah. was a big hockey fan, and. Uh, it, it was a collector's something or another, and uh, and we kept telling him, "Hey, man, you got to get it out of the office because we you know we work in a single white trailer that has a hole in the ground. And it's condemned. You know, it's going to get jammed up." And, <laughs> right, right. So Brian Harris, who was in my flight, um, he decided to play a joke on him, and uh, he actually went to Toys R Us and bought a hockey stick that looked kind of like it. <laughs> yeah. And he waited till he went to lunch, and when he came back. He was actually slap, you know, doing slapsticks <laughs> with his rocks. So here comes this guy running. No, <laughs> and that's and we kind of had it planned out to where when, when he figured it out, like Brian kind of like hit the hit the stick enough where it was almost about to break. Yeah, 
he literally like hit it really hard and he saw the stick break. <laughs> and he just, I mean, the guy just freaked out. Yeah. So yeah. Oh. But it, but it was a great guy. It was, it was a great experience. Um, even, I mean, that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making a joke out of somebody, but he was actually a really, really good guy. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. We went, uh, at that time, I think the first trip that I, that I did with them overseas, we went to do intrinsic action. It was, uh, it was a rotation for, uh, for the mechanized unit to go out to, uh, to Kuwait. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so we were kind of doing that and in the, in the process, um, we were kind of going into back to the A socket at Doha, right? Okay. Doha. We were kind of going back and forth and whatever. And it, it was, it became a very interesting trip. Um, cause we were going out controlling cast and then teaching people right. how to do e cast And we, we did a little bit of work with, uh, with the UK, um, fire support guys and just do some cross training and stuff like that. And we were controlling out at the range and the range, by the way, was at the time, all, all there was was a grid square. Yeah. It was, it was just a grid. Like there was no tower, no nothing. Right, right. Sadly, uh, not that long after we were there, uh, you know, the cat, that, that Sith cast incident happened over there. And, mm-hmm. uh, but it was, uh, it was also interesting working with another, with other countries in terms of doing casts and, working with Kuwaiti uh, F-18s, which for those who don't know, like the pilots from those countries are members of the royal family. So they don't necessarily have to be the the best. <laughs> right. <laughs> related. Yeah, yeah. So you'll be standing out in the range and you're controlling and, you know, the guy's in IP inbound and he'll say, you know, Nasser 3-1 in from the south. And then you turn around, looking towards the south and you don't see the guy. <laughs> And all of a sudden you see him coming from the, from, you know, from east to west. And it's like, it was, it was scary. <laughs> yeah. <It's> scary. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, so we did that trip and, and came back and then I got, um, I got orders, um, to go to Korea. Okay. Very shortly after. And, uh, I would say I was only at Fort Benning, maybe two years. Okay. And uh, so I got orders to Korea and most of the people that went to Korea went either like, you know, to ID, right? So Red Cloud or, or Casey or Stanley, whatever. But yep. I got orders to go to Yongsan. Nice. So in the cap, so I was like, um, and thankfully, thankfully, um, 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 O'Neill, Sean. O'Neil, yeah, yeah. He actually was in that assignment. Really? And, and he, he, he told me, yeah, you're going to be working something called the deep operations coordination cell. And you want to be working like eighth army. And it's like, wow. Okay. That's All different, right. Yeah. <laughs> something different. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so I went over there and, uh, I, I, by the way, let me take a quick step back. I look back at my entire life, even from when I was a kid till now. And I see that there's things that have happened along the way that probably didn't make a whole lot of sense. But they play, they pay dividends um, for me down the road. Oh, sure. Um, for sure. And this happens to be one of those cases where, um, so I went over there and uh, it was just a four man element. So we still had to maintain our currency, but we went to do these exercises and it was like, like a large scale exercise, but it was literally like on a, their version of NORAD, I guess. It's a, you know, it's a mountain. You're working inside of a mountain. Oh, okay. Was it four Tech P guys, or was it just for you and three other dudes? That- it was me, uh, Steve Gant was the the NCO, the NCO, the, the, the master sergeant, and then um, then we had two ALOs. Okay, okay. And uh, it was Ken Roselski, which eventually was one of like the first guys, in, I think that was starting to do the the ASOC thing in Afghanistan. I think. Oh, okay. Um, which I happen to have met his brother because his brother actually worked at SOCOM. Oh, really. At eight, yeah, you know, so we're doing these events and it's, I mean, you're talking, I went from like, hey, control like an A-10 for, you know, and in support of this X, Y, and Z and to like literally looking at entire battle space yeah. and they go, hey, this is what's happening on the first week of the war and you're seeing this counter fire. It's just like very, very big. Sure. Pre-9-11, right? So we have no concept of this. Right, right. But this was the first time that I started seeing things like um, kill boxes. And, uh, yeah, they, I mean, it, they were like rough concepts they were kind of, um, kind of working through and, uh, and then also, um, starting to use TBMCS and start using ADOCs and all these things that for me, I thought, well, you know, this is something I'll learn for now and I'll probably never see it again. And 
Yeah. One of the things that I, I learned at Fort Benning and then I kind of took it over to actually to every single one of my assignments after that is that uh, if you want to get in good with the army and they don't know you, right? Um, the first thing, they're always a good entry point or a safe entry point is to go and say, hey, will you guys like a class on emergency close air support? Yeah. You know, just a class on fires. And that's kind of a good way to start developing those rapport. For sure. So when I was there, I, um, I um, up at Yongsan, they actually had a special operations Korea soccer um, component. So, you know, so I always really lean in that direction Yeah. when I was growing up. Or I kind of like, like, I, it wasn't necessarily the Rambo thing. It was more like the uh, the Green Berets, the John Wayne Green Beret thing. Like, I always found that very intriguing. So so anyway, so I went and, and talked to those guys. And they're like, oh, I'm great. And I taught them. And they actually took me out. He goes, hey, you, you, you want to go jump with us? And uh, I wasn't on status, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> So I showed up and, uh, so I, I show up and, and, uh, the place that told me, Hey, you, you know, we're going to pick you up and we're going to go out to, to this place. And, you know, I'm, I'm living in downtown Seoul. It's a city of millions of people. Yeah. So, so they pick me up and we go and I notice we're not going to, uh, to an airfield. We're going to a big open field and there's a balloon. Oh man. Yeah. And I'm going like, the only thing I've done in the jumping is essentially, you know, I'm a, I'm a five jump chump out of jump school. You know? right, so, right. but I say, Hey, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. I've heard about these jumps. I mean, people have told me they're just, that's the best blast ever. Like this, this balloon jump. So you get essentially in the balloon and they kind of like, like lift it up. And, and, uh, when you're up there, um, they literally like open up the door, the, the, the kind of, and you're essentially, it's like a little, it's almost like a little conga line. Yeah. <laughs> So it was, uh, I learned a few things that day. The first one is, um, there's no such thing as a jump refusal in the, in the, in the, in the, in Korean soft. Right. Oh. And, uh, so, so, and it, and it, and it was a certain major jump master, by the way. And, uh, so like, you know, they open up the thing and the guy, he was like, you know, Hey, and the guy said, like, ah, ah, go. <laughs> And then I, all I saw, you know, cause a bunch of dudes and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not that tall. So, you know, I'm kind of like, all of a sudden I just see like, I just see like somebody getting lifted up and thrown out. <laughs> so you, so you, you kind of go and like, you, wait, how you know, big you, is this? Uh, how big is the basket? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing like a, you know, like a balloon with a, I've seen them, you know, just civilian ones, but is it like a military is, balloon or is it like just a civilian no, no, no. balloon? No, 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 no. It's like a, it's like a, like a balloon balloon. Like okay. A, not a, yeah. It's, but it's basically, I mean, and, and you're, you're cramped in the thing. It was only like six. It was, if I remember right, it was only like six or seven of us. Plus okay. The jump. So, so I mean, you're, you're, you're tight, you're, you're packed tight. Yeah. And, uh, so, and the other thing I learned is that, you know, when, when you jump, it's very eerie because you don't hear wind blast or anything. You just hear the, the rubber bands popping the. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, ah. <laughs> So that was a good time. And by the way, if, if Steve Gant ever ever hears this uh, this podcast, that will be the first time he'll learn that that I, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I did that over there. Right, right. So, so again, and and by the way, when I did when I got to uh, there um, to Korea, he was also putting together the Tiger Challenge. Remember that? It was like yeah, yeah. yep. So I got there, and he goes, "Hey, I'm putting a thing together, and uh, it's in like." Uh, like a week and a half or something, and you're competing. I'm Thanks like, for the heads uh, up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, oh, okay. And uh, so I, so I competed, and and again, another very unique thing that paid off dividends down the road. And uh, so I'm meeting these guys that. Um, but you've always been that, in really good shape, so you probably it was probably wasn't like a whole lot of train up for you. I mean, you're probably ready to go. I mean, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I, I mean, all, all things considered, I finished fifth. So I don't everybody in Korea and, uh, I mean, there were like hard hitters there that you had John Knipe and then you had, um, Kurt Newman was there. Oh yeah. Yeah. All Toya was there. Uh, Price was there. Robert Sirio was there. Yeah. Um, so I, I did, I, you know, I, I, I did okay. All things sure. considered. And, um, um, but yeah, so, so I, you know, so I did all these things and, uh, so leaving Korea or before I left to Korea, I had an assignment to, uh, 
and you may or may not remember this, but um, I had an assignment to Davis Mountain. Yeah. And I came and I came to you and I said, "Hey, man, um, you came from from there, right?" Or he and you you kind of told me he goes, um, "I don't know if they're doing AB Triple C or that, any kind of that stuff anymore. I'm not really sure." Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, when I was there, they um, they closed down our unit, but they, all the guys that or half the guys that were in my unit went to the AB Triple C, and then I think they was that what the was what you're going to was the AB Triple C assignment or it I had orders and and the thing is is um, um I wasn't coded for like an air crew anything uh-huh. so it was it was a so I I had more questions than anything else I had no reference to who to ask so I went ahead and. Uh, decided to call myself call assignments and go hey i'm, I'm not complaining because <laughs> right. i don't want to end up at fort drum after <laughs> or fort hood or whatever so i was like, i'm not complaining but i just want to make sure that this is this is right and uh just so happens that the person goes hey so um yeah yeah it was a mistake you shouldn't have gotten those orders i'm like okay yeah. and the person said um where do you want to go <laughs> nice and I said, yeah, I said, hey, you know, you know, shoot your shot, King, you know. And I said, hey, what about Italy? Because I heard everything already where I said, hey, go to go to Italy. So yeah. Camp Ederly, hold on. Okay, you're good. Camp Ederly it is. Nice. Yeah. So I left uh I left Korea July, August of two thousand one. And then I yeah, it was pre nine eleven and it, it was right before nine eleven and then I went to uh to uh, Italy. Okay. So I got there and, uh, you know, Brian Harris was there and Blaine Anderson was there. Um, so we, we did, uh, you know, we're doing PT and stuff like that. But one of those things about Italy is, um, in my experience, your assignments are going to be a really cool job, but kind of a shitty station or or vice versa. You have a really awesome place to live, but like the job is like tough for one reason or another. So one of the things about it being stationed over there is uh, for us to jump, we had to like drive from Vicenza to Aviano, like literally like, like how, bus how long, salt. how long is that? Like, that's a pretty long drive, isn't it? In real, it, it, if you're talking about me driving from point A to point B, it's like 40 minutes. If you're oh. talking about going with the army, it's two hours. Oh, geez. And then you have to go and you manifest and you do everything pre-jump and whatever. And then you may get there. And uh, if you, you ever been to Aviano? I've been to Aviano, yeah. Not so, you know, you have the base and behind the base is a humongous mountain. Mm-hmm. right? So sometimes you'll get there and the mountain was, you couldn't even see it. Oh, okay. So you're there and you're, this is, you know, then they say, hey, you know, jump is cans. Because the, the way that it, it would work is you would take off from Aviano and then you'll fly out to Venice. And then from Venice, you'll turn around, go around the mountains, and the drop zone was on the other side. Oh, okay. Um, so, so there was a lot of like that kind of stuff going on. And then whenever we had to do any kind of exercise or something, we have to go to Germany. <laughs> and then you, and then in, in Germany, you either if you were gonna do like like gunnery or anything like that, you went to Grafenbeer. But if you were gonna do their and their JRTC type rotation, you had to go to Holmsfels. Right, right. And. Uh, for those who never, you know, for Holmsfels, essentially, the history behind that place is that Hitler picked that place because it was the worst weather in all of Germany. And it showed. Yeah, exactly. It was. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he got that right. <laughs> so, so we spent a lot of time going back and forth, back and forth. And, um, so a lot of the, the, the traveling around Europe that we yeah. did was more of a run over there. Let me take a picture. What is it? I'll explain later. And then you just kind of keep going. So you didn't really have time to enjoy all the travel. It was just army travel, which is never fun, and it's uh, just a pain in the ass. We 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 made lemonade, sure, sure. You know what we had, but um, but but it was it was uh it was one of those places that you kind of wish you could have. And then and then when that happened, of course, nine eleven happened. Yeah. Which we we were actually in Germany. We were in Germany, and we were going from Graf to Holmsfels. Okay. And uh, it was two rental vehicles, and uh, yeah, I guess they're all out of the military now. So, so, so like the front vehicle. So I, I was in the vehicle behind us, and um, um, the vehicle in front of us was like a like a station wagon kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Or van, you know, but with the the doors that kind of like slid back. Sure. Yep. So we and then somebody, and I can't remember who it was, but basically they had rolled the doors back, and they were literally like being a JM <laughs> in a, in the middle of, of a road in Germany, and. Uh, 
So we're we're so we're driving, and all of a sudden, that front vehicle like when we're and like and we're like oh shit. so we like stopped and and all of a sudden the guy who was driving was uh, Brian Harris okay. and Brian is uh, his dad was in the military. Uh, he, he's he's a what what do they call it a uh, like a military brat. Military brat, right? Yeah. So he was a military brat, and but so he had spent a lot of time in Germany, so he knew some German. Sure. So he comes up and goes running to our vehicle and goes, "Hey, what's going on?" They go, "Hey, um, something about an attack, the U.S. and something about New York." So we're like, "What's going on?" And yeah. so the guy, our commander, who was in the vehicle, like he goes, "Hey, let's. We have like uh, what do they call it? AFN or?" Yeah, yeah, yep. So we kind of go like this, and on the radio, all it was saying was like Threcon Delta, report to your military installation, whatever. We're like, what the hell's going on? So we went out there, and it was literally downright, just this shy from frisking us on the on the way in and whatever, and on the way to Hohenfeld when you pulled in right. Hohenfeld. Yeah. Okay, right. So yeah, so we so we went out there. We're like, we we were kind of like. Just wait and see what, what what was going on. Then they kind of start telling us what was going on, and not a you remember those days. Like there wasn't really a whole lot of info. It was just a, yeah, we got attacked, right, right, terrorist right. terrorist action, whatever. So you know, so the army unit that was there, um, you know, they were very like leaning forward. The one seventy third was very leaning forward, like, oh, we're we're all here. We're ready to get on an airplane and end the war, right, um, before it begins. And uh, so we we were kind of just stuck there. For, for a minute, we never really went anywhere, but obviously a lot of the plans started changing and things like that. And we were like getting more stood up to do to meet readiness, that kind of stuff. And so, it, but we never really, we never, and from Italy, like the, the 173rd never, the 173rd proper never really deployed in that early in the war. Okay. Now guys from TACP from all over were getting pulled to like go support soft and whatever. Right, right. Because of the, the demand signal was ridiculous, but it wasn't until like 2003 that, uh, or 2002 that this the thing in in Iraq started like ramping up, and mm -hmm. uh, we got told um, a um, start like getting ready and whatever. And uh, the plan at the time was for us to get to, if I remember right, it was to get to Turkey and start driving south. And we were supposed to be like reinforcing siege of sort of north. Okay. And, um, but then like at the last minute, there was a big change and they go, Hey, uh, Turkey closes, close to close the doors and yeah. whatever. And so, and it just so happened that during that time period is when Bando brothers came out. So, you know, so you're watching Bando brothers and you're watching the, the jump. Yeah. You're like, Holy sh Wow. Everybody talk, talks the big game, but that's that that's intense. Yeah. So we're like, hey, well, hey, we're truck assaulting, you know. So our commander walks in from a meeting, he goes, change of plan, boys. We're going in under silk canopies. So I remember um, when all that stuff was happening, uh, we we said, all right, we, 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 this is what's going to happen in mid-March. It's really when it's going to kick off and we have to like go, you know, go up and we're still going to go in, into, into northern Iraq and whatever, to, essentially to reinforce people. It wasn't really like what you guys, by no means, it was what you guys were doing or what, uh, what the Ranger Regiment did. But um, it was just essentially to put a lot, put a brigade size element on the ground. Sure. Um, so, yeah, so we, uh, so you get to it to Aviano and you see like 10 C-17s, like, like the realism of a hitch. It's like, yeah. wow, man. Yeah. So we all got in. So we all got into the, in, into the, the, you know, getting ready to stage and whatever. And uh, I was on, it was 10 aircraft. I was in chalk 10. I was the second to the last jumper. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so they said, hey, if you don't jump, like if you don't get out the door, you, we're going to fly all the way back here and then you're going to fly in on a resupply. I'm like, I'm only doing misery once. Right. And we were literally weak because nobody had an idea what was going on. Um, I remember that I was, you know, when you're going to do that a combat jump, they, they weigh you without, without, uh, without equipment. And then they weigh you with everything on. Sure. Yep. So I was 152 with nothing and I was over 300 pounds because yeah. it was a yeah, rug, web and whatever. And yeah, cross yeah. we even jumped gas mask out of all. I have no idea why, but <laughs> we kind of got there. We jumped and the whole, the whole place was filled with mud and everybody long darted in. 
it was it was it was it was a crap experience, whatever. But um, anyway, we consolidated and moved out, and we started pushing south, and some controlling was being done, but nothing. I would say nothing like very decisive or anything like that. It was just you know getting on the radar. A lot, a lot of it had to do with more of a showing of force and. That it wasn't necessarily about going kind of super kinetic or anything. At least for us, it wasn't. Right. Now, guys, going forward, this is on the same push going south is when um, John Knight dropped the the, the sensor fuse weapons along the, the ridge. Yeah, yeah. So he did that, and then they, those guys kind of pushed forward, and then we eventually ended up clearing and clearing Kirkuk. Okay. So we moved in there, and uh, after that, we started staging operations from there, and we were. Sometimes we, they kind of did a pool thing where basically guys were going to go out to support these guys, come back and you support these guys and whatever. And um, I was, I pushed out with uh, um, the brigade actually had a lurse element. Okay. And uh, so I went out with them um, once or twice. And this is, again, this is pre ID, pre whatever. So you're literally rolling with like no doors. Right, right. Yeah. And that kind of thing. And, uh, and when when I was rolling with with those guys alerts, it was literally like two uh, two pickup two. Uh, I think it was like one one SUV and like one pickup, and and that was it. Like we were we were nowhere connected with it. Like it, something would have happened, nobody would even know that. You you know that now, right? Sure, sure. And you probably okay. had no armor. The vehicles probably weren't armored. You probably didn't have any jammers at that time. Is nothing. We were pretty vulnerable at that at that early point for sure. So I did that trip, and then eventually I, I came back, um, and not that long after I um, I PCS'd over to uh, oh, and when I was on all my trips to Germany, by the way, um, um, I started meeting guys from other units, and uh, me and this guy named Chas Bocook, we hit it off really well. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so we so we started like calling each other, going, "Hey, man, I'm gonna go on this cast trip. You want to go?" And he was like the ultimate dude at planning cast trips. Oh, for sure. Like, like literally second to none <laughs> to give credit where credit is due. Yeah. So, so, uh, I think when we were both leaving around the same time and, uh, we both had assignments to Fort Hood and, uh, he called, uh, Mark Lutz, which was also in Germany. Yeah. And, uh, somehow Mark Lutz called somebody and bottom line is we ended up at Pope. Nice. So we got to Pope and, um, it was a very different it was it was relieving it was it was good for for us to be over there because um, um quite honestly to be candid like the morale in the units at the time in europe were not wasn't really that high you would think that you're in europe and but the reality was it was like you couldn't go to any schools or um like your tdy stuff was so like insane like we had to yeah. i remember one time i had to fly from italy to utah just to that do that one control with a JDAM and then fly back. Jeez. So it was it was yeah, so it was kind of intense. So so I got so I anyway, so I got to uh I got to Pope and I had made tech at the time and we we it was is a really, really cool mix of people and there and everybody was like really, really hard charger and you know, whatever and so we we're getting ready to deploy to Afghanistan. So we went and, and we did a lot of a lot of you know deployment prep up training and stuff like that. And again, same thing. I always say, well, let me meet my unit. And so I met my unit and started you know leveraging through the ECAS thing. And then eventually, this is where the Balo program started. Mm -hmm. So I became the Balo. So that was kind of like a new experience. Now I was you know, I had been a JTAC then on on in Italy. And now I'm kind of a Balo, and it's you know I had no idea what to expect. I say, hey, you know I I know what that captain does. So <laughs> right, right. And for those so who don't know, a, ba an e a BALO is a battalion ALO. And at the time, officers were ALOs, uh, enlisted guys were, were JTACs or ETACs at the time. I can't remember when it switched over. But they were starting to make like guys like Juan, who was a, a um, more experienced JTAC, he could fill that BALO position. So just to give some background. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I went to FUF Salerno. Okay. And, uh, and that literally was the first time that uh, – uh, there, there was a lot of really eye-opening things that happened during that trip, um, uh, both professionally and, and operationally. Um, for one thing, um, that was the first time that I've actually kind of, no kidding, saw what task force kind of did. Right. 
or had a general idea of what they were doing vice what everybody else was doing and say, wow, that's, wow, that's very different. <laughs> yeah. And one of those things about, um, in Fof Salerno, which, which is in this, in, in, in Eastern Afghanistan is this bowl it essentially surrounded by mountains. And, uh, there was a lot of things because of the location, you could strategically push people out in different directions. Right. Um, so, um, so we met with a couple, you know, we met with the ODAs and the people that were essentially on all the, all the border positions and stuff like that. And we, we met, uh, so one time this SEAL team came over and, uh, cause they were going to conduct an operation in the area and, uh, they came over cause we were essentially controlling all the fires in, uh, in South of Salerno mm-hmm. cause we had artillery and everything. So, um, so I, so I met their team captain and a guy named Michael Murphy. Um, so, you know, great guy. I mean, he seemed, he seemed, he seemed like a pretty good, pretty good dude and uh, whatever. And, uh, so they were, they went out to the, to the border. They, they did their thing. Then they came back and, uh, they say, Hey, we're gonna, can you guys help us out? Cause we have to like, we're going to get redirected. So we have to go through this place called the KG pass, mm. which is this road that was eventually essentially, uh, what was essentially is it's a, it's, 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 it's a shooting gallery, if you will. Right. Uh, I'm pretty sure you know. So we kind of went and we did these things and I had guys, um, I had JTAC teams at Gardez and then I had another JTAC team down and down the south at Cervantes. And so we did all these things and um, I don't know, it was a, a week later, week and a half later, we heard about what happened. And as it was happening, uh, they told what was going on and there was a feed uh, I remember seeing the actual feed of, of, of the, of the Chinook getting, getting hit. Yeah. Which was extremely sobering experience. Um, cause essentially when you're, for those who don't know, sometimes, uh, sometimes being out forward and getting shot at is easier than when you're sitting on a jock watching something and you feel kind of helpless for sure. Um, so you kind of saw what was happening and, and not that long after, um, Al Jazeera played videos of the, them going through all the bodies and going through all their equipment and whatever. Yeah. And it was one of those things because you know you 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 have this thought process that some that were, were invincible, particularly people at the higher higher tier. But that moment you start realizing that combat levels out the, the, the whole playing field. For sure. Just, yeah, nobody's safe. Right. So we, so I, so I, I went out a few times doing, doing operations and, uh, you know, we did some controls, um, and we did some kind of fire stuff and whatever. And, you know, we, we, we got some guys and, and whatnot. And, uh, so I did my job and I, I supported guys as best I could. And one of those things that I tell you that it was hard also was seeing one of my guys on a mountain and seeing like, essentially the Taliban hunting for them and they yeah. were like on the top of the mountain and they're surrounded and you really can't do anything for them. Good thing that that guy and, and, and the element he was with were really hard chargers. That guy's DeLorean Sheridan, by the way, he, okay. he uh, yeah, became a combat controller and became one of a silver star recipient. And yeah, great. One of the cool standing airmen of the air. Force. I mean, great. I mean, the, some of the guys that I deploy with, I mean, that I, it was, those guys had done, gone out to done great things. Clint Campbell's another one. He's now the the twenty fourth. Oh, I'm sorry. The he's up at Holbert. He's well, he's a uh, he's the command chief. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I mean, guys have done incredibly well in their career. Uh, so it, it was kind of a it was kind of as profe- as a in profe- terms of professional development. I, I thought it was a, really cool to see how these guys did their thing and yeah, yeah. And, me, and me learning to deal with the fact that you have to kind of let things kind of play out. Right. Right. Even when it's tough. Wasn't Jorgensen there too? Didn't you mention? Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. So another Jorgensen. great guy, another solid guy. Yeah. I mean, again, all incredible dudes. I mean, they've done incredibly well in their careers. And um, Jorgie just retired not that long ago. So, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, but I still, I still wanted to do the soft thing, and uh, and I was also like doing school, and uh, one oh, and one of those things in that in that trip was um, we had a. This is the first time that I met actually OGA people. <laughs> and, oh, that uh, <laughs> it actually went, actually went really well. Yeah. Um, um, it, 
this is one of those things that I've never heard this happening before or since. Um, this guy worked for in, in, in one of those agencies and his son was actually a lieutenant in one of the in the in the quick reaction force from for the brigade that I was with. Really? Yeah. So when, when I was doing my my degree, my bachelor, I was, you know, I was, along the way I was doing school and stuff like that. And uh, I was I did a minor. I did a double minor in securing intelligence and international relations. OK. So a long time ago, I read this book called Jawbreaker, and it was about those like PMO teams that was, were early on in the fight and what they were doing and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, that's like insane stuff. Yeah. Pretty cool. So I said, man, I want to eventually like I would like to try to do something like that. So I met the guy. So, so I said, "Hey, you know, I, you know, I'm not a I'm not a groupie or anything, but you know, I'm, I'm majoring in this and what." So he he kind of gave me some tidbits about, "Hey, you know, do this, do that, and make sure you know, just kind of gave me some pointers about sure. where to go and to study." And, uh, so I did that, and I was along the way, and uh, and he also told me that, "Hey, you know that special forces guys also like if you do end up not doing that and staying in like special forces guys have intel intelligence sergeants in their teams and i, I had no idea about that yeah um, but it's like oh all right cool he goes yeah sometimes we like you know sometimes you know all those agencies at some level some in iraq in some capacity sure, sure. so um, so anyway so when, when, uh, so i got back to uh so my it, that was that was supposed to be a four month trip I was a month seven and a half by the time I got back. Yeah. So when I got back, um, um, uh, they say, Hey, um, you, uh, you got selected for soft. Nice. Ah, cool. So, uh, so anyway, so I, so I transitioned over to, to, you know, the, the, it was what 17 day sauce OLB. Right. Right. Yep. So I went over there and here's like, and Paul Britton, I, I met, I had met Paul Britton in that, competition in Korea as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So a lot of the people that were there, I already kind of knew. Sure. Um, and so we kind of transitioned over fairly quickly. And, uh, I already knew a lot of guys at Bragg that had come from Italy and then they went like soft, like army guys. And then they kind of went to soft and then they were there. And then when I, when I was already there, even when I was up at the 14th, I kind of knew them. And a lot of them goes, Hey, can you come teach, um, ECAS classes or whatever and fires classes and those teams. So I did. Um, and little did I know down the road that that was going to pay off dividends because then when I got there and they go, Hey, we're going to do this exercise. Those guys were going, Hey, you know, why don't you come over and do this, you know, come out with us and whatever. And so we were doing, whenever they were doing gunnery, I was doing gunnery with them whenever, yes. like it was almost like I didn't have to go out of my way to find a way to train. Sure. They were literally calling back and, We've well, already built those relationships, so you know right. it's a lot easier that way for sure. Right. Yeah. So I did that, and uh, and you know our, our rotation schedule for trips was relentless. It was it was it was it, I mean just like you guys it was but it was it was very yeah, like I always say you guys had it worse than we did. We we had a set schedule. You know we we would go every three or four months. Maybe I think I went five at one time, but uh, uh, the OLS the SF. OLs, you guys were always gone because there were so few of you and there's so many ODAs. I mean, I've said this a million times on this podcast, but it's just, it, it, there was never enough guys to go around and you guys were always having to, you know, backfill or stay later or go longer. I mean, it was, yeah, you guys got run so, ragged. So one of those things um, that was, and I, I didn't, at the time it, it didn't make sense um, initially, but eventually it, it did. It was, um, us and STS and um, were deploying in off cycles from the rotations, and for us, and you know, for us coming back from supporting army units, we you know we we go and they go. Sure, sure. You know, uh, so it was a little odd, right? But right. At, eventually, I kind of understood that it was the the idea was you wanted to have a if you were going to send out a junior guy, you wanted there to be with a senior team, and then when a new team would show up, you had a senior JTAC and that kind of thing. So we. It was a leapfrog type of thing. Sure, you had that continuity. Yeah, we we kind of did the same thing when we worked with OGA. A unit would come in, we'd already be there, and then we'd rotate out. One of those things, um, like I mentioned before, that some things happen in life that you have no, you'd never really give much thought to it until later on how sure. how it pays off. Um, 
my well, in my time and actually in Fort Benning, my time and my time in Italy, probably not so much, but my time up at, at the 14th, I did a lot of time working with um, with the field artillery people, like understanding the process. And you know, I didn't want to step in their toes. I go, hey, I'm not trying to be I'm trying to do your thing, but I just I want to understand your process better than just me calling an artillery. Like, what what are you doing? What is sure. so? And it worked out really well when I went to when I went to uh, to Salerno, being at the being at the talk and whatnot, and uh, doing that kind of thing, and controlling a ton of artillery, and controlling airspace and stuff like that. So right. anyway, so I go over, so I am over at uh, at OLB, and uh, they go, hey, uh, so you're replacing PAV downrange. I go, okay, cool. <laughs> so you know, so I'm doing this thing, and you know, I get you know a message from PAV saying, hey. You know, and uh, he goes to me, you're going to be real busy over here, da, 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 da. but Pav wasn't very specific, even whenever, you know, we were, we we're done secure comps, sure, sure, but yeah. still, he wasn't, he was still, I didn't quite know, you know, how bad it was. Right. It just so happens that my next door neighbor, where I was living at, uh, was actually working. He was working at, he was a, an ODA team leader, but um, he, he would check all the like the the in sums of the missions and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. He go he, he goes. You say you're going to you're going to Cobra. I go yeah. He goes, dude, you're gonna be busy. You're gonna be like busy, busy. I'm like, all right, so bring it. You know, so you know, again, hard charger kind of thing, kind of yeah, mentality. Yeah. Yeah. So I get to Afghanistan, and uh, so they kind of push us out, and uh, I met. Before I, for whatever reason, I didn't replace Pav at the firebase. I replaced Pav at Bath. Okay. So he's like, "Listen, dude, man, this is what's going on." And I'm like, "Wow, holy, wow." Okay, cool. So extremely busy place. A lot of people have um, a lot of units that rotated to that place. I mean, it it that place eat, ate up alive people. Like it, like a lot of people got injured or killed. Like a lot of team guys and a lot of JTACs got hurt over there and whatever. Yeah. So I land and, uh, you know, so, so my, my Chinook land and I'm getting off and whatever. And, uh, I met my, I met the guy who was the acting team leader because the acting, the actual team captain had been shot and he was gone. So it was like the chief was actually the, the, the uh, working as the, the team leader. Yeah. He looks at me and the first thing he tells me is, wow, we sent back Pav and they gave us half a JTAC. <laughs> you know, yeah, for those who don't know, Pav is yeah. a, a pretty tall dude. Like, he's really tall. Yeah, big, I think he's big like, guy. Yeah, like six four and like two sixty or something. Yeah, like that. he's it was ridiculous. Yeah. I'm like five foot six and like one hundred fifty pounds. <laughs> right, right. Like, so you know, so I, you know, so I, so I kind of laughed it off and I kind of went back. He he could go snowman seriously, like you know, happy to have you, whatever. And um, he goes, this place is insane. Like we can't even get you couldn't even get ground resupply. Uh, so everything was pretty much an airdrop or, or a helicopter. Um, we, uh, and it was literally, it was like three fire bases that were like that. It was, uh, Terrancout, Anaconda and Cobra. And yes. those places were like, it's, it was, it was just insane. Uh, yeah. like, like, like how, how insane it was. Uh, so long story short, uh, we go out on a, on a mission and, uh, every special forces team, um, in that area had a, 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 a Kandak contingent, which essentially was, a, you know, your indigenous forces that were working with you. Right. So I kind of had an idea from my last trip in Afghanistan, the quality of what we we're going to get, what we had. Right. But what I, but what I did not, what I wasn't prepared for was the fact that half of those guys were literally working for the other side. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so literally like you will literally be leaving the serpentine. And you got information that somebody was calling saying, Hey, they're leaving the, I mean, literally it was, it was like that. Yeah. So we went out on our first mission and, uh, and the very first mission we went out to, we, we went up to the, on this Valley and, um, we were driving and basically we started getting, we were essentially in a, we ended up on an ambush. So we were getting ambushed from, from West to, from West to East. And then, uh, there was a sniper up at a up at the village that we were going towards so um a couple of guys got shot and uh so you know so i was on the radio 
you know, trying to get air. And then my, you know, basically I got my, my antenna got shot off. Jeez. And, and at the time there was no MRAP or anything like that. It was just essentially a GMV and you have a seat. It's essentially a Humvee and you're sitting on the back end of, of a seat looking backwards with a 240 and you had your, you know, your, 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 your backpack with your radios. And, but right. you're essentially, it was your body armor and your helmet. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so I was doing that and my antenna got shot off and I went, you know, I, I, whatever. And somebody was returning fires. I was trying to do that. And, uh, so then there was a B1. They said, well, I want to send a B1. And at the time the B1s had no pod. Yeah. And we were, it was, it was a fairly close contact. I'll say those guys were shooting us less than 300 meters away. Okay. Which became the norm from that entire trip. There was nothing that was farther away than 300 meters. Jeez. So we, you know, whatever. And then, so, uh, um, one of the gunners actually got shot and, uh, he, it was a very unique shot. It was, he got shot essentially between the shot came right next to his eye. So it was a very, very, and it wasn't like a barrage. It was, so at that point, you know, he died on the spot, but we realized it was a sniper. Okay. So then eventually though, eventually, you know, and those guys were kind of yelling. It's like, Juan, where's, where's the air? And it's like, Hey, they're sending it. But then the B1 called and they said, Hey, uh, I would got to hit a refueler. Come on. And we're like literally in the middle of the tick. I mean, we had nothing. So we had to, had to end up essentially going back and uh, like breaking contact, going back. And then a helo came in and like picked up the wounded and the, and, and, and the, the operator that got, um, that, that expired. Um, but it was one of those things where like, it was literally the first mission that I had been in that, uh, like, like somebody literally within arm, within arm's distance of me, like, like, like died. Yeah. And I, I took that, I almost, I took that to heart from the standpoint that this will never happen again. And, you know, so I got back and I called, uh, you know, I was calling CJ Soto and I was like, you know, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was really amped up, you know, and, yeah, and the, yeah. team, the team kind of came over to me, like to give me, you know, give me a little bit of shit, I guess. But when they saw how amped up I was, they like, left me, let me alone. They understood. Like they were going to get upset because you didn't have any cast, but you were, you were more upset than they were that yeah. you got some V1 that had no pot on it. Couldn't have really done anything for you anyway. And it had hit the tanker. Like what, like right. I always, you know, I don't want to get off this, off the subject, but you guys, I had a lot of respect for you dudes because when I went out with the Rangers or my recce team or OJ or whatever, I had everything. I had every asset I could possibly want. I had ISR, I had all that stuff. And you guys, a lot of times would go out and it was just you. I mean, you barely, and then you had to request like conventional fire support assets and they weren't, you know, I don't know. Sadly, that, that team was, that team, it was two teams that were in that, in that fire base. So it was, um, it, we had a combat controller with one team and then you had a tag with the other one. Yeah. And uh, those guys were all going to rotate out within a, within a, within a week or two weeks. So this happened at the tail end of their deployment. And I, I felt, and then after that, they didn't they didn't want to go out, and I, I felt, you know, I felt horrible. It, I and again, look in hindsight, I mean, it wasn't something I did, but you no, feel you responsible. Just, yeah, for sure. I I totally get what you're saying. It right. wasn't your responsibility. It wasn't your fault. There's nothing you could have done about it. But at the end of the day, it, yeah, I know, I know what you mean, man. So I got with uh, JTAC from the other team, and he was a senior airman, and uh, arguably one of the funniest. Think of uh, Jeff Spicoli, <laughs> okay, <laughs> but very proficient. Okay, but he was only a senior airman, and a guy, a guy named by Adam Cervais. So uh, we became really good friends, and then he said, "Okay, all right, man. So like, we're gonna go, we're gonna go get some, do, do an airdrop, man. Just come with me." And so we. So I kind of learned, I kind of learned his, his, how he did his thing. And I, he kind of learned how I did artillery and setting up TRPs and stuff like that. So we were kind of doing that. And, uh, and, the, and well, this like hold of, um, of mission. So, um, so, uh, the new team from third group started to show up and those guys were starting to do left seat, right seat. And, uh, the other team, um, the one that Adam was with. Um, was going to go out with some elements of the third group team, but some of the guys from both teams had not made it to the fire base because um, they were like, you know how they have to like do the finance thing elsewhere and like sign off and whatever. So yeah, yeah. like it wasn't really a complete team. Okay. So they say, Hey Juan, why don't you, 
you want to come out with us? I mean, you don't have to do the JTAC thing. You just, we just need a driver. Sure. I'm like, all right. So, so I go out with them and, um, we go to this, this place that we've ended up visiting and revisiting along my trip. And, uh, it's this village called Yaktan and Afghanistan Yaktan. When you look at it in a map, oddly enough, um, the town center is essentially a bunch of stores and they're shaped like an X, okay. like a crosshair. Yeah. And I, I probably should have picked up on that. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so anyway, so, so we, we, a lot of folks had no idea why there's such a huge influx of fighters going through there. We, little did we know that was actually the opium route. Ah, oh, okay. So literally what, what the, all that place in Southern Afghanistan goes right through the opium route. Wow. So, so we went, so we went out there and uh, we got into contact and, you know, so I'm doing my thing. I'm just, you know, helping out, but I'm monitoring the radio, keeping tabs on what Adam is doing. So he, you know, he's. He's doing his thing and they get past the village and they kind of go to a, a point, a, 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 a piece of high ground overlooking down at the village. And then we all kind of like, and then he was with um, some elements of the ODA and then we had the, some of the, some of the Afghan army guys with their, um, what do they call them at the time? ETTs, I think it was like their, the U S liaison within an Afghan contingent. I think they were called ETTs or oh, something okay. like that. So he was there and he got, he got shot on the plate. He was fine, but he was there. So they went to try to get him out. So Adam was controlling, was controlling Cass or he's starting to get the Cass coming over. And then I, I kind of went up there in my vehicle and kind of set up in front of them to lay suppressive fire. Mm -hmm. So it just so happens that, uh, an RPG shot from the village and uh, from far away, actually, it was very far and it exploded right on top of Adam. And, uh, and, it, and again, like I said, we're all kind of exposed, right? And uh, Adam just happens to be leaning forward and the debris went through the back of his helmet. Oh. So, um, and this happened literally, um, uh, not 10 feet away from me. And at this point, you know, I'm, I'm a tech sergeant. He's a senior man. So you almost inherently like assume responsibility. Sure. So I, you know, I, I was like, you know, it, it dawned on me and I, I look at the team sergeant and I go find another driver. And he's like, what's going on? He goes, Adam is down. So I had to like go to Adam and grab his equipment and start jobbing away. And, uh, some of those rounds came in and, uh, the guy who was going to be the team leader for that new team got his arm, um, shot off Jeez. and, um, uh, he took debris and, uh, oddly enough, that guy, um, stayed in the military. He's actually like a, like a poster for the, for the army, for army SF. He's oh, yeah. great guy. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm doing this and I, you know, I start controlling Cass and, dropping bombs and then in the, in the, in the process of me trying to score him away, then somebody came up to me, he goes, Hey man, here's actually the, the guns up, up at, uh, we had some one fives at Cobra. So I started calling an artillery, essentially a barrage just to give us enough time to start like trying to control the situation. Cause we were boxed in when we were at. And, uh, so I was dropping artillery and I started, then I started coordinating and, and everything like that. And I started dropping a few bombs and, so we eventually got out of that piece of high ground and we were able to get a, hel a metal back helicopter to come in and take out the guys who were injured and, you know, an Adam and some of the guys. And, uh, so then they kind of went away and, and then we kind of started rolling back towards the, towards the fire base. And, uh, we were literally getting shot the entire time we were back Jeez. and, uh, to the point where like, like I was in the back and like my, my two, the 240 was the, the medic was actually doing the 240. I was shooting with my rifle and I was controlling and, uh, I'm, I'm out of bullets at this point. So I'm literally like down to my, like, I, I, I don't know what I was going to do with an M nine, but that's all I had. <laughs> and, uh, we were still getting shot and literally we did like the Afghans left some vehicles. So we were literally like grabbing guys and throwing them in the truck as we were driving. Uh, it was a very chaotic situation. And, uh, no doubt. so we, so we kind of get back and, you know, that was, that 
I think was the moment that like, 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 uh, kind of crushed me, but I didn't know that at the time. Sure. Um, but it was one of those things because me, you know, Adam, Adam and I became close really, 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 you know, it's within, within a month we were like, it's almost like we knew each other for like a long time. And, uh, yeah. and he was very, I mean, he was, he was an excellent, he was an excellent example of what an ST operator should be. Um, so, uh, I kind of wrote, I kind of wrote a memo to, uh, to his, to, to the stock. I said, Hey man, so like, this is actually what happened and this is how he performed and, and on a personal note. So that, um, I did not know this he, times later when they were having his funeral in the States, like they read all of that. And, and uh, I'm happy his family like got to know that at least clearly they were devastated that his son was gone, but at least they were able to know that he, he died on his feet, you know, nobody will ever question the, the valor of that guy that day. So anyway, so the stock contacts me up and he goes, Hey man, so we're sending another JTAC. And, um, he just, he, he retired not that long ago. So, uh, so his name is Jerry and Jerry eventually like did his sometime at the, at the 23rd and then he went to the, to the 24th and then he retired from there. But, uh, so I met Jerry, he's like, uh, he's like, Hey man, you know, I've, I've worked with tech P before, man. Like you guys are cool, whatever. Um, he goes, and by the way, I know that you've had it really rough, but, um, I'm like a, he told me I'm like a peace bomb no matter where I deploy, like, like I don't have to drop bombs or anything. It's like, I said, like he, he's like, he's a cooler. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm like, bro, I don't think that's going to make it But where you're here. <laughs> he goes, all right. He goes, wow, we'll see. We'll see. And, uh, we went out and a few times and we, I mean, at that point, like the new team, thankfully for me, the team had been there because it was a third group team and a seventh group team, and a third group team and a seventh. It just so happens that the third group team that was there before the seventh group team was actually the same team that, that came in. Okay. So they knew the area already. They were like, they, oh, we're going to Vancouver and whatever. So, yeah. so we, so the, at the time they kind of made a, a very intelligent decision. They go, Hey, we can't really, we can't really roll by ourselves here. Let's just, let's just combine what's left of our teams because literally before they even passed the left seat, right seat, they already lost guys. Sure. So we started rolling deep and me and the, me and Jerry said, listen, this is how we're going to do this. So like, we're going to, you're going to be the lead on a mission. I'm going to be back up. And if, when this is happening, I'll, con you know, one of us controls artillery, the other guy, or facilitates getting cast and the other guys. I don't know why at the time at the, at Siege of Soto, they didn't just declare a tick and do the air. And eventually it became like that when you needed air, somebody said, Hey, we're on a tick. You declare a tick and all you had to do was turn on your radio. Just oh, right, wait. Right. But that wasn't happening at the time. Yeah. So we, so we went out and, uh, so we would go out a lot of times and, uh, we were getting, I mean, it was really, really intense firefights, like, like really hardcore. So we did this one mission, um, that stood out that, um, we were going to go back to the same place where Adam perished and we were going to go deep. And, um, so we're driving through there a couple of us were dismounted a couple and some guys were actually uh, on the vehicles and uh, we started taking contact and uh, this thing lasted about 11 hours sustained Jeez. like it was and uh, the first time i ever seen an rpg coming at you you see the swirl behind it oh my god like it was like that and uh so i'm like so we're jobbing and and jerry's jobbing and we're literally passing aircraft back and forth between one another and and uh, those few times where it pays off to be short was actually that day. Um, so an RPG was coming directly for our truck. The guy who was on the, on the gun, he lowered himself and uh, I was in the back and the round. I, all I did was make myself into a ball yeah. right behind that tire. Right, right. And the, ra and the, the RPG hit maybe three feet and all the debris from the, from the thing actually hit the tire. So it, hit, it landed outside the truck or it, it almost touched the tire and it hit right behind it. So the debris. Oh my God. So like if I would have been in any way exposed. Yeah. I would have, I would, I wouldn't got hit that oh. whip and, and not a bullet, but an RPG. But so 
So we, you know, we kept jobbing away through there and literally it was him and I, him and I controlling. I think I, I dropped like 55,000 pounds of ordnance and he dropped like an super amount too. It was really ridiculous and that. So we eventually like made it up to high ground. And, uh, actually I'll say a story about this guy. He's actually this good of a shot. You remember how cool it was when we got the, the little SACCOM antennas that were like, had a, had a handle. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Those things were like, you know, that was, that was, you know, during the year, you're living in the year 3000, right? <laughs> right. So at that point I had gotten back to my vehicle and he was walking up to like a piece of high ground on the South to clear it before we could move our trucks over there. Mm-hmm. So he's walking and he's actually like talking to the ASOC as I'm controlling. And you know how we have all, everybody has Peltor. So for those who don't know, like on one ear, you're talking to your team and on the other ear, you're talking to all the assets, mm-hmm. something that I argue that I can do today. But anyway, so he's walking and he has his, his, uh, his little sack on antenna and a guy comes from the back of a boulder with an AK 47 and did, if I wouldn't have seen this, <laughs> I would have never believed that he literally like like through the, the sack on, grab his rifle, shot the guy at the head and cut and caught the sack. No on way. I no shit you way. to the point, <laughs> to the, to the point where in the middle of a gunfight, somebody went on the radio. You hear, Whoa, did you see what Jerry just did? <laughs> oh my God. That's awesome. It's like, it's like, you know, so it was, I, it was, oh, that's cool. Up. So yeah, so why we got so eventually we made it all the way up there and uh, so we secure like pieces of high ground and we had we did not necessarily make it into the into to, into into Yachtan that night. Um, at some point in the fight, um, I was I had a I had a ISR platforms and I had CAS and I had a and even some helicopters and whatever and we we're shooting artillery. So. So I was talking to the ISR platform and my team leader goes, Hey man, what, what, I mean, we're getting shot from like all over the place. Like, can they give us like an estimate of what's going on? Cause he just sort of doesn't know. So I started asking the, the ISR platform and go, Hey man, like, what do you estimate? This? And he didn't want to answer. And like, he was like delaying and I'm, you know, at this point I'm getting pretty heated. I'm, I'm like, just give us a damn estimate of what the hell's going on. He goes, uh, over 200 people surrounding your position. Jeez. You know, so Nate, the moment he said that, I remember thinking to myself, like, I, I kind of like, I, I I accepted the reality of what it was. I say, you know, it was me. I think I was 30, 32 at the time I go, hey, that's a good run, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, so I went to, to the team leader, I goes, you know, 200, over 200. And he looked at me, he goes, well, We'll keep going until we can't. Yeah. So we, so we go, so I have no idea how this happened, but when it was all said and done, um, I, only one guy got shot on the thumb. Uh, so anyway, so I was, I was up in the, in the piece of high ground at this point, it's already nighttime and, uh, I had a gunship and everybody was just, I mean, you're crushed. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sitting on the. Um, I, you know, I, I did the first watch cause I obviously I was controlling still. And I remember being like this and, you know, just resting my arms and, and I'm, I'm talking to the, I'm talking to the gunship and, and he's going, well, wow, man, like that's whatever he, he goes, Hey man, the guy told me, Hey man, do me a favor. Like turn on, turn on your radio really loud. And it, like, if you have to micro nap or something like, like we'll, we'll call you up and, and, uh, I go, okay. So um, I didn't quite. Pass out, pass out. But I was, I was, I was, I mean, I had an IV on oh and uh, he, he, he goes, uh, da, 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 da. he calls me up and goes, Hey, there's two guys that are digging up like an IV. I'm like, where, you know, you see the, you know, the spotlight. Yeah. I got it. Uh, far for fair. Kutum, kutum, kutum. And the guys from the team, literally we were so, uh, Work about the whole thing going on that they, they just kind of woke up and go, oh, what's going on? I go, so some guy's ID, okay, got it. And they all went back to sleep. <laughs> Jeez. We were done. So we, so then, you know, that we eventually went out to, to the village and then we, you know, we, um, we saw like we did SSE and, uh, it was a substantial amount of 
casual, you know, enemy casualties. Yeah. Okay. And so we cleared until that, and we literally stayed there that night. We cleared the areas that we had to clear. And um, the following day, we got a tasker saying, hey, you guys made it this far, so like go. So there's a village like like five kilometers north of you. It was literally on a, on a, on a dry creek river bed. So you can kind of see the village at how far. Um, you need to go over there and clear it. And we're like, we haven't cleared anything from here to there. Yeah. I mean, it's it sounds, for those who've never been to Afghanistan, it sounds, distance-wise, it doesn't sound that far. But when you're talking about a country that everywhere you go is up. <laughs> right. Uh, it's a substantial amount of, of uh, distance. So so I, you know, I called it I called it in and, you know, I said, hey, you know, we're doing this and kind of preparing for, for what was coming. And I was down to the point where I would turn on the radio and I would call See, just sort of where I will call the, the, you know, the ASOC and say, hey, this is such and such. And they will basically go, are you on a tick? Like they knew already the call sign that. <laughs> right, right. So we say, hey, we're doing this. And so kind of expect what was going to happen. So we started driving through essentially the, the river to get there yeah. because like, what the odds of somebody digging an ID on a river is remote. Never zero. Sure. Very sure. Remote. So we're going up there. They go, hey, you guys don't have cash, but we'll send some Apaches out there so these guys were flying essentially a racetrack going back and forth and we're like hey you know and la -da 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 -da, and whatever and they're going up there and they go hey we see those guys and we're like oh crap you know so all of a sudden i start seeing rpgs getting shot at the at the apaches so we said everybody goes go go like gun it you know and yeah. so i'm sitting in the back of the truck going hey drops in contact <laughs> <laughs> i'm yelling whatever so we're kind of trying to get there and on one occasion i saw one of something clicked one of the one of the heels oh no but the guy stayed and what they were this is very 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 i mean this speaks volumes of how how courageous these guys were they were doing essentially like a shooter cover right so like one guy would come in and like pulling at the guy that was on the ground, the guy would come out, this guy would pull off, and the second guy would come in with the gun. Yeah. The rockets. So eventually we made it out there. I'm like, you know, we were like, okay, yeah, this and that. We're like in this, you know, my truck was marked with a panel, whatever. He goes, yeah, yeah, I see you. So this guy, these guys like, we go, hey, man, we're, we're like Winchester, whatever. So there was another set of Apaches that showed up, and, and those guys went back to TK, and they landed. And the, on the way in, they told... They had called in and they go, hey, we're already there. We need to go back. So have two helicopters ready to go. So they literally landed, got out, jumped on the next set of Apaches and flew back. Wow. But it was, I mean, it was insane. Like it was, it was the Wild West. It, it went in every mission. There was really, never really a mission where we didn't really take contact or something really wild would happen. We were dropping bombs. And so uh, fast forward. A few weeks after that, um, when we call Sijo Soto, they go, hey, uh, so National Geographic is doing this show about special forces. And uh, they managed to talk to whomever, and they basically agreed, like the Army agreed, that we should let them go to a fire base and, like, you know, capture real world how the guys do things. And, uh, and everybody looked at each other like, this is not the place. Like, there's a lot of fire bases, and this is probably not the place you want to go. Right. But somebody thought it was a good idea. So uh, they went out there. So they came in and they landed. And uh, I mean, it was one of those like, hey, how you doing? I'm such and such. And I can't guarantee your safety. It was like the first thing on the yeah. gate. So we went out. So we took them out one day and, and we, you know, we, we thought long and hard about it. And the team leader kind of rolled me in and he goes, hey, man, um, you know, how, how do we go about doing this? Um, and then we all kind of agreed that, hey, let's just kind of do like a med cap or something so they can get their footage. So we did like a day med cap thing and then we came back and then um, then we decided then they, we went out again and it was around the same place of Yachtan, the same place with the big tick. And uh, we were driving through um, the side of a, of a mountain. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had like some of the Kandak guys kind of walk in front of us um, with uh with some mine sweepers, some mine detectors that half of them didn't even have batteries. They only found out. <laughs> so they're going and go, Hey, we found a, we found a, a mine. So we stopped 
and uh, we took out some C4 and we went and blew it up. But when that explosion happened, it, it unearthed another two in front, but it also unearthed two behind us. Oh, my God. In other words, we're on the side of a mountain and we were essentially on a mine road and there's no way of getting out because it's, you know, it's a road and basically you just fall off. The cliff, yeah. And we were already getting information that they knew where we were at and the team was split into you know, some guys were on this side of the, the river, some guys were on that side. So, so we, we were stuck. So, you know, so they started keep clearing things and, and like the communicate, like you could tell that they were getting ready for like calling people up, Hey, yeah. bring such and such guy from whatever. You're talking about the enemy, right? You're going to, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was like, so I got on the radio, go, Hey, I need to know what's on the air right now to all of this. Everybody in, in the mind of everybody, I, it was in the back of mine, but I realized in hindsight that it was in the back of everybody else's just that uh, there's a lot of things that you need to do in those situations. And the last thing you want to think about is you have a few civilians that are recording the whole thing. Yeah. So you're man, how am I, how am I going to play this out? So we keep clearing. And uh, I think at the time uh, they say, hey, we don't have any cast available, but, you know, just kind of keep us both. So we clear enough where. I kind of pulled off and we, we had clear enough of a route to a piece of high ground and I parked and me and at this time, Jerry had transitioned out and then, and another JTAC had come in from, from, from another STS. It was a new guy. So we had, you know, they, those guys had transitioned out. And, uh, so we kind of told him, I go, Hey, so like, let's do this. Like I'll control till midnight and you control after that. And so, so that was around the same time that all this stuff was going on. So. So we had, I just got to the piece of high ground and I got off the, the Mark 47, the gun, the, the, the cruiser weapon. And I got back to my rucksack to like turn off the radio mm. and, uh, the vehicle that literally pulled in next to mine was the one that hit the IED. Oh my God. So I did, the. Uh, I can, I can say this now laughing, but you know, the, you know, the, uh, the, the Charlie Murphy story where, uh, where Rick James kick him in the chest and he flies like 10 feet. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I remember it being like that, like you, you oh felt like you feel like I'm like, whoa, and I hit this, uh, this, this big boulder and literally my, I hit so hard that my back plate like cracked. Oh my God. So I'm in the ground and the only thing I can think about, cause I felt, you know, you felt that intense heat. I mean, yeah. literally I was not 10 feet away. I mean, I was probably like five feet from the IED. So I like, I, I was scared to look at myself. Yeah. And I remember seeing the smoke, like the, the heat coming out and all I kept thinking about was DT. And, uh, and I remember then I looked, the only thing I was, I dare to do is like, look at my hands and in my, uh, in my, in this hand, I don't know if you see the finger, but yeah, I had like a, like a silver dollar size of like a shrapnel. Oh. And, uh, so I'm there. So I'm like, shit, like I hadn't, I didn't know where to move or, and I kept hearing rounds sipping past you know and uh so here's where some of the the some of the stuff with people that have traumatic brain injury kind of plays in for those who don't know um everything that i'm going to relate after this is how i remember it and time later much later that the team actually got back and they told me and i mean literally it's like me talking to you i was talking to jd and they go no man that was brandy you were talking to Brandy the whole time, but I remember it like I'm re like right now. Huh? So all I kept doing was asking for my gun. I like, where's my rifle? Where's my rifle? They're like, they're like, just come, come. So <laughs> they, um, they dragged me and they, they had set up like a little CCP. So I went over there and, uh, on the guys that were on that truck, um, one of them died almost immediately out of, out of overpressure. And, um, for those who don't know, essentially what overpressure, what an overpressure death is, is basically your body is, looks normal, except literally you're like rubber, mm. like it crushes your bones essentially. So I'm sitting there and, uh, and the guy who was the medic, good friend of mine, Rob, he goes, Hey man, and like, like hold the eye, like, cause I had to stay, they wanted me to stay uh, awake. Sure. And I'm like, yeah, so I'm holding an IV bag and I'm like, I'm like, oh, you think he's going to be all right? And he goes, yeah, yeah, he'll be all right. And I said, cool. And then they brought some other guys that were injured and some of the National Geographic guys were injured. So then eventually a helicopter landed and um, they picked some of us up and um, and we flew back to TK. And uh, 
when I was told what happened, he goes, yeah, you were on the ground. You went over like that. We took it to the CCP. You did do the thing with the bag. You were feeding an IV bag to, a, to somebody who had expired, but they needed to keep you alive. Then you stood up when this, when the helicopter was going to come in and you walked on your own down to the helicopter and along the way, I don't remember any of this. Along the way, you kind of said, you, you very casually, you, you say, hey man, check it out, man. There's an ID right there. Like they had, literally people, people had dri driven past it and had not set it off, but I saw it and it was very casual. So I made it up to the helicopter and I told, uh, apparently before I got into the helicopter, I told the guy, he goes, hey man, um, I'll be back in a couple of days. I, my wa I left my wallet uh, in the, in, in the, in my room so just make sure you lock it like i was having this i don't remember any of this oh my god then we got into the helicopter and um on the way up like you know the national geographic guys were there with me and uh, apparently uh, and i sort of kind of remember this but not quite exactly when the helicopter was taking off um i saw an rpg through the window and the helicopter kind of like did this and he goes oh my god what's that and i said Oh man, that's just an RPG. Don't worry about it. Like I was very like nonchalant. I, oh, God. but I was, I'm, I'm, I was, I was checked out. I was, yeah. Like I was, I don't, yeah. So I, you know, so they took me to TK and they started taking out a lot of shrapnel. I shrapnel on my face, on my arm. Oh. Um, I messed up my back a little bit, but I can still walk. And, um, and then I blew out. Then my, my peltor had bent up and like I was bleeding through my, you know, through, through my ear. But you know, all in all, um, I was I was walking wounded, right? So uh, they go you and I was gonna leave uh, the following week. By the way, this all these things that horrible things that happen in that place is always so people that are living with that are gonna leave within a month. Jeez. So uh, so I got back, you know, and I'm like, you know, you know, they pick me up, and I remember way before that I had spoken to Mark Hurst, and I remember him saying that. Man, when I got hurt, like, uh, you know, you kind of think of your family, this, but the thing that I, that I, he was worried the most is that, oh my God, I'm going to lose my spot on, on the Rangers. And I remember at the time, you know, that was, that was my life, you know, that was, I was petrified of like, so I'm like, hey, I got to like turn this around and like get fit quickly and whatever. And uh, I, I rushed a lot of things. Um, physically like you know they did you know therapy with my hand and whatnot and so i was able to like do my thing and i was i got back on jump status and so i i deployed again but they said hey why don't you this time around you just go to siege sort of yeah so i was like okay you know i get it um so i went to siege sort of and um at this point um, there were a lot of things in my life that were very very unbalanced um I was putting a lot of emphasis on my, on my career. Um, I wasn't really paying mind to my home life. And, mm. and also, uh, during my recovery, you know, cause you're literally like messed up and they go, Hey, you have a, you know, I have a blown eardrum and you have like, no, whatever. And you can't do this and you can't do that. And, but they cleared me through everything. And, uh, so in the process of me being banged up, um, uh, my my then ex wife wanted to have kids, and I felt kind of bad about you know me being gone, you know, and and that's really something she wanted. I didn't necessarily to truth in lending. I didn't necessarily care to have kids, but that's really you know you for whatever reason I thought it was the right thing, and uh, then I found out that I can't have kids mm -hmm. on top of trying to deal with the things that I wasn't dealing with. You know? Yeah. So my mind wasn't really in the right place, you know, but my goal is like, I can only control what I can control. Sure. So let me, let me get back out and like try to at least make peace with what happened through like, you know, whatever. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Mm. So I went out and uh, I went to see Jasotov and I did, uh, I did much in that trip. I literally um, sat on the see Jasotov desk and it started as just the TAC P guy or the, the JTAC desk but i ended up um the the fires guys that see you sort of have brought in mm -hmm. for one reason or another were weren't there so i had to take over the entire siege of soda fires 
And it was, to put it in context, like Siege of Sotov is like a multinational, it's like 30 something countries. So everybody who has soft contingents would come to me with requesting cast, requesting uh, artillery, requesting this, setting up, setting up missions. I was doing it all. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, setting up also the status of all the guns all around the country, plus all the JTACs that were kind of fielded out and, uh, and dealing, you know, and then getting, you know, integrating with the stock and, and I met some, I mean, some of the guys at the stock were, were, were really, really cool people. Um, I, I did that trip. I came back and I really thought that oh, once or twice that I did actually had to go out and I was okay. And uh, so I, you know, I, I kind of thought I kind of put it behind me. And, um, so I got back and at this point my, my, my marriage was not done, but I was trying to like, you know, duct tape as much as possible. Yeah. And, um, and they said, Hey man, like six months later, you have to go back out and go back again to see you sort of, and we'll send you back to see you sort of it. And that's like, whatever. So, um, so I split up. I literally, like at this point, um, many people don't know, probably you never heard of this, but before I even left, I, my, I didn't even have a place to live. I was like sleeping at work. Oh, no, I didn't know that. So, um, so I, uh, so I went and uh over there and uh i was incredibly stressed out at this point because i had no idea what was going to happen in the uh, divorce and all this stuff and uh and then um one night i went to i go to sleep and um i i don't i don't know how to describe this but i'll do the best i can um i started reliving the mission where Adam perished. And it was to the point where I could hear the radio. I could, I could hear the call signs. I could recall grid squares. I, I mean, it was, it was a recollection that, that before or since I've ever had on anything. Wow. And, uh, and I remember, um, you know, the moment that Adam gets hit, I remember waking up like in a panic and I grabbed my gun and I almost shot the door. Oh my God. And, uh, at that point I realized that I, I, I can't, I, you gotta know when you gotta know when to call it, you know? Sure. And, uh, so I, you know, so I had to make some decisions on the spot that were career, career ending decisions. Mm. And, uh, it was very tough and I couldn't explain it to people. Um, I had no idea until I, and, and this is the value of what you bring with this podcast. Um, I had no idea that everybody else was going through these things. Yeah. I was afraid of even talking about it because I was afraid that I may trigger something on someone else. And I couldn't, I didn't want to get in the middle of that. Yeah. Um, the train didn't stop. So, um, so I made some decisions at that point and I called it and um, I had to, I had to go back to the States. And I realized at that point that it wasn't just my job at, at the, at the OL, but my, my job in general was done. Yeah. And, uh, it was morale crushing cause you, I had no idea what I was doing at this point. Mm. So I, um, I flew back and, uh, you know, I checked in, uh, in, in the States and I, I was, I went to like a psychologist and, uh, on Pope and they kind of said, you have no business getting back out there and they go and they go, Hey, um, and I'm like, please don't like, don't like if there's a glimmer of hope that I, he goes, you have no business. So they literally just said, you're, 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 you know, you're done. Wow. And uh, then they go, and, and also you need to go back. And for whatever reason, they thought that I had, a, that somehow I had a, convinced people that I was okay to let me deploy again, that they made me go to other doctors. And then they realized that they go, your ear thing is still not like you have no, no, no right balance right now. And your ear, I, 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 I did know that I had a problem already determining the direction of sound. Oh, okay. Like, like if I heard gunfire, I couldn't tell you if it was east to west or north and south. I just heard 
around the sound, yeah. which is overwhelming on the senses. Sure. And um, so I started doing all these things, and then I started realizing along the way, when all this was going on, um, when I was at CU Soda, I did some college classes, but I noticed that my GPS kept going down and down and down, and I kept like, and I just thought the material was getting harder. But I noticed my GPA went from like 4.0 and I ended up um, with a, my degree, I ended up with a 2.9 when I graduated within a short period of time. Yeah. I know, I, you know, it's sometimes it's easier. Um, but, and I say this without, without um, a huge amount of sensitivity. Um, um, you know, somebody who loses a limb or something, it, it's like, it's obvious, right? Right. They, but when it's something in your head like that, you don't really quite understand what it is. Yeah, you don't realize it's going on. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah, it's undetectable, essentially. And I, like everybody else, thought that the trigger incident for PTS, because I was already noticing I was very, like, short. You've had a lot of people here that have spoken about this. I'm not really going to go back into that because you've, you've covered this in, um, in, in great detail with everybody else. But my temper was short. Um, not just my temper, but my, uh, my patience was like non-existent. Yeah. And, uh, I go back to these other doctors and they go, yeah, you, you're, you're messed up here. You're messed up here. you you have, um, um, SI joint damage mm-hmm. on your back. Yeah. I mean, it was all these different things and they basically go like, what am I going to do? Like, so, um, they told me that, Hey, go, we can keep you in the air force, but you're, you're not really gonna, essentially they told me I wasn't even going to have an AFSC. I was just going to be a floating around a floater. And I, I, you know, that's for guys like us, that's crushing. Sure. So I just said, just med board me at this point. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, um, Matt, it's like, bless his heart. Like he tried to talk me, talk me into like, what about this? And what about that? And, um, and, uh, but I, I, I just couldn't, I, yeah. I, 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 I knew I was a lie. I already knew I was a liability. Yeah. So this is, so at this point, this is like 2000, 2008, uh, end of 2008 going into 2009, this is during the recession. So, um, I get med boarded. I had no plan. There's no jobs anywhere, mm-hmm. literally no jobs. And, uh, then I was, um, I contempl- I've always said I'm going to move back to Florida, and uh, when I went to pick up my uh, my copy my at the education center, when I went to pick up my records, um, somebody was talking about to somebody else about Ember Riddle open up a satellite campus in Orlando, in Orlando, for whatever, and it was like hey, he's again, and then somebody did like the 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 9/11 GI Bill, and mm. they're basically able to pay for their entire masters, getting a VAH, and like not pay a dime out of pocket. Right. So, right. And lack of any other plan, that's what I ended up doing. And uh, during this whole process, um, the Air Force um, wounded uh, warrior program, whatever they call it now, uh, was very disconnected. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was pretty much, it was like, hey, uh, um, we have you on file and call us if there's any changes. That's literally all they did. And uh, yeah. But the SOCOM Care Coalition um, did wonders for me. Like they were like, they were on, on it and they basically go, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And they were helping me. And there was a transition team, um, from a company called nine line. And, uh, they, I had an advocate, a wounded warrior advocate for me. And, uh, he was like, let me help you. And this and that, and he helped me. Those guys helped me immensely. And, uh, but I was stressing that I didn't have a job yeah. and I'm, I'm getting treated for things, but I'm like, I'm not a hundred percent right and and they go hey so in the process of all of this um i was living i started living with who is my my wife now and she told me she goes you know i'm a personal trainer why don't you like do that just i know that's not what you want to do for life but at least you have something you can focus on sure so i started part-timing it as a personal trainer for lack of anything better to do so i did that and uh along the way and um, the same company nine line went ahead and told me he go hey um so they have they're starting this thing out called the warrior games and we socom needs a program manager to start a wounded 
uh, essentially a wounded warrior athlete team and we need to put it together from zero. Are you interested in doing that? And, uh, and I said, yes. And that's probably one of the best decisions I ever made in my entire life. Um, when you're seeing all these things happening in your life and by the way, the, as I was about to leave for Bragg, like literally like uh, every week there was a, there was a funeral. So it was, it was bad. Like it, it's just a reminder. So you're trying to find some kind of a way to deal with, with that and people getting hurt and whatever. And uh, the first thing they did was they took me to the Paralympic games at Whistler. And it, you know, it's, it's, it was in the winter games. So, mm -hmm. so for those who don't know, like the, like on the Olympic, the Olympics happen one week and the next week is the Paralympics and here's all the disabled athletes participating. So you go there, I go, I'm, I got to start a program doing this. And so it's better to see how those guys, what those guys do, but you have an expectation of disabled, right? But I had no idea what that, the capability that some of those people had. Right. The first event I saw was a downhill blind skiing. So the guy who competed in the Olympics goes down first and he's essentially like a few seconds before the guy who's blind. Yeah. And he's doing turns. He's got a microphone on his back. The guy who's blind is going as fast as the other guy and timing his turns off of sound. Wow. Same mountain, same. It wasn't like a, like a, it wasn't a different mountain or like a, you know, like bunny slopes. It was the real deal. Wow. So you're kind of sitting there like, wow. Amazing. The very next event was, um, uh, uh biathlon. And, uh, so there was a guy who was going to, so, you have the shooting spots, you have the bleachers shooting spots behind it, you have a mountain. And essentially there is, you have to zigzag to the top and come back down and shoot again, do it twice. And one guy had no, uh, no arms, not, not no hand, but no arm from the shoulder down. And you're seeing like the shooting spots and you're seeing a huge mountain and you're saying, how, oh, what's going to happen here? Yeah. This guy literally went out and was passing people with one arm literally skating up a mountain and when he got to the shooting spot he would literally fall under on the on his shooting spot grab his grab the weapon with his cheek and literally the the the, the trigger actually has a mouthpiece really and he does not miss a shot that's amazing so anyway so so i go to all these events and my whole perception of of what this is is is, is changing by the second it's like wow and then I started meeting a couple of like wounded guys from, from soft coming in. And I met this guy who, um, at some point, if you want to look him up, his name is Ivan Castro. He used to be, uh, he used to be in the Rangers enlisted. He got commissioned that, uh, he wasn't the Rangers. He went to special forces. Then he got commissioned and back to regular army and in Iraq, a motor round hit. He's blind. He, he's missing one eye and he, um, barely had any to no visibility on the other one. But this guy is a career marathon runner, blind. Jeez. So the way these guys run, um, you're running with your partner and they have a, a leash between them. Uh -huh. So you're timing your run based on your arm movement. And if you have to turn, the person tugs, the lead tugs, and you're making your turns. Wow. He's a competitive marathon runner. That's amazing. So I met him. So he's, you know, we're, um, and I'm, I'm, I met all these different guys and, and, uh, so one trip in particular, um, we had a guy who was a Navy SEAL that um, he uh, he got injured uh, and he had, he had he essentially ran into a mine. So he lost. He was an above the knee amputee. So uh, he was up at Walter Reed. So we go up there and um, and uh, I go there and I would always bring somebody else who was a wounded after you know, wounded guy. Yeah. So because again, my injuries are transparent for the, for, you know, for everybody. But when you have somebody who's blind or missing a leg, you know, it's, it's very apparent, right? Sure. So he goes out and, um, he goes, follow my lead. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so this is Walter Reed. So he, he kicks the door of the room and he had a stick. He goes, where's that motherfucker? Like, where's that? <laughs> like, and, uh, and the guys, the guy, the guy doesn't know either one of us at all. had never seen us there. And, uh, you know, we started talking about, he goes, Hey, you know, this, there's these things and there's, you know, and, uh, you, know, you see how, uh, everybody who we went to go see a Walter Reed is just deflated. 
because of what happened, yeah. understandably. So, so, uh, so we convinced them to go out to a uh, to, uh, disabled athlete camp up in San Diego. So I'm over there at the, at the, at the, at the event. And uh, somebody was uh, doing, uh, like showing new people how to do biathlon. So they had a, a, a ski erg, you know, the vertical rower mm-hmm. to, to, to simulate the rowing. And then they had the, the gun. And then, uh, so he tried it out and clearly the guy was an incredible shot. And, um, and that triggered something in his, in his, in his mind. And uh, two years later, he went to the Paralympic Games. Really? Yeah. So anyway, so I can I can go I can I can talk days about these kind of stories. It was just back and forth, back and forth. But um, I started out that that project, that program. But uh, after a year, I had to transition out of it because the money for the position was not being paid by SOCOM. It was paid for the Olympic uh, Committee. Mm-hmm. So it was like almost to the point where like they weren't going to make the time to pay for my build it for the next year. Gotcha. Okay. So Chas Bocook out of, out of out of the blue just calls me up. He goes, "Hey man, uh, I when I was up at a uh, deployed, I was working with the Rangers. I met this FSO or this uh, F, uh, fire support chief called Rob Buck. He goes, hey, he works up at SOCOM, this and that, and he's working for this company called Jacobs, and then they're doing this thing where like they need like a JTAC SMEs to do this study about uh, modeling and simulation." Um. So, you know, I took the job. Nice. I did that. And um, so we did this study for, for uh, what, the, what the problem question was, was, you know, can you replace guys controlling airstrikes live with, um, you know, virtual events? Yeah. Clearly, nobody's a fan of that, right? And, right. Uh, but um, as I was talking to people, a lot of people had uh, apprehension about it. But what I did tell everybody was the same thing is you have to codify why that is you can't just you can't just say well because i've been doing this for a while and take my yeah. word for it right? yeah, yeah so we did this study for about a year and uh you know come up with obviously there's some goodness of doing using a sim and you can create very complex scenarios that you can't do in real life necessarily so there's some goodness to it but sure. it wasn't conclusive um so i went to work up it then they basically said all right so the study's done now it's literally manpower support at, at the headquarters so i went that's when you and I interacted again. Yep. So I was doing the the, the training piece at the at at, at, uh, at SOCOM, uh, kind of figuring out how to balance all of that for you guys to kind of do your thing. Right. So I did the best I could, and again, it's uh, when you're working over there, people don't realize you, you can't place everybody, and so you you're kind of doing the best the best you can and kind of managing all these things and whatever. So I did that job for a while. Then I decided to take a break from the military stuff, um, and went to work at a hospital. In modeling and simulation so i did it for about a year and i it, i did not like it and uh it just so happens that when i was transitioning to that i had applied to another job it's doing modeling and simulation but it's more like a operations research okay and i had even forgotten about the job like the guys call me i go hey you applied for this about a year ago i'm like oh yeah yeah and i'm literally on the phone looking up what the hell did i apply for <laughs> right <laughs> But, um, but yeah, but yeah, so they called me up and I went to the interview and, uh, I really didn't think I was going to be a candidate for it. And, uh, but I thought I was the ringer, you know, cause they can't interview just one guy. Yeah, yeah. But as it turns out, I did very well and they hired me on the spot and, uh, they, I kind of went to work over there and, uh, it's really cool what I do now. Um, I do all those like research type studies and in terms of weapons and munitions and some of the guys are like hellfire and things like that. And. And how the fight's kind of shaping out and threat intelligence stuff and everything and uh, so i gotta say and, I, and i'm kind of in a i'm kind of in a, in a good place right yeah. now when it, professionally and uh during COVID, but I, throughout throughout the years i still struggle with uh getting used to the new normal this is not really a military town right and uh during COVID, um uh, i had to find a hobby right because i can't just lift and uh i got into playing guitar oh right on yeah. So, uh, yes, I've been playing guitar, uh, right now, whatever. So I kind of find a, I'm kind of at a place right now where I'm really, really nice and balanced, but I got to tell you, looking back at all my life, like I'm in a good place right now and I'm really happy where things are at. Um, I see that a lot of the things that happened to me along the way, uh, even the things that I perceive to be the, 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 the not so great things actually turned out to be the best things that ever happened to me. Yeah. 
I've been involved with a lot of, uh, you know, as a result, after the wounded, after the working at Nine Line, I, I got involved with a whole bunch of these organizations that deal with uh, disabled or people that are retiring and stuff like that. And I do help behind the scenes to include, the, um, in some cases, um, uh, guys that were working at the TACP Association at the time would call me up and I would kind of give them information about here's all the, like, all these nonprofits that can help. Oh, yeah. I'm so thankful and now that everything is incredibly well well organized across yeah. the board, not just some, not just with these guys, but across the board, where things are better. But that uh, that pretty much brings me to today. Right on. Yeah, man. Well, man, that was awesome. Uh, I like I said before, I you and I have interacted many many times, um, and I had no idea that any of that stuff went on, and I I. I I don't know how that happens. I don't know how, like, I, I don't know if it's probably my fault for not digging in, but I can't thank you enough for coming on here and sharing. I know it's not the, the easiest thing to do to not only kind of relive that story or those stories that you went through, but also to just say, hey, you're struggling with PTS. And like you said, it gives other people a, like a almost a, a, a free pass to kind of let their stuff out. You know what I mean? And I, that's, I really appreciate you doing that. I know it's not easy and I'm, I'm just glad everything's working out. I mean, it really, I, it, from what you said and what you've gone, been through and what other guys have been through, I feel like you guys are so, so strong and such good role models for everybody else. I just can't thank you enough for, for doing what you do and, and what you've done. And I really appreciate it, man. Well, thank you. But uh, at the same time, I'll, I'll throw this, I'll throw this back at you. Uh, this, having this podcast and what you've done and the people that you brought in and the people being able to share the story is something that was a uh, wolf. I, I don't want to say woefully overdue, but I'm really glad that we got to a point where we can find guys and people that are willing to share these things and, and kind of tell the folks that are coming in behind us that, you know, it's, things happen. Right. Um, and, and don't feel bad about not digging into things. Um, I ran into Kurt Newman, let's say about three years ago uh, yeah. here in Orlando as out of all places. And, uh, you know, we went out for a drink and, you know, I kind of told him, you know, what's going on, like, like all these things. And he, he had no idea. And Kirk and I, like, we're, we're close. It's just, you don't know. Sometimes you just don't know how to, uh, how to t talk about these topics because you yourself don't understand them. Like, sure. you don't understand. You think PTS is one thing, but it's actually something else. Right. And when you have, and you compound that with traumatic brain injury, uh, which is something you really don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's a lot of things like that, but I'm, but I'm glad, um, things have, um, worked out for a lot of folks, um, yeah. in these situations, some, because there's a lot of folks that don't, yeah. one of my, one of my closest, uh, war, one of the people that I work closest at nine line, um, he was actually a, a warrior advocate, an incredible story. I don't know if you ever heard of a guy named Mike day in the Navy SEALs, but um, yeah. So, uh, I work with him and, you know. Sometimes you, you have to stay on top of, of um, the, the long and short of it is no matter how tough you are, no matter how strong you think you are, or how much you thought you've overcome, you, you, you got to share things and you have to, you have to learn to, you, you have to humble yourself and, uh, and, and, and be open about things because the, when you least expect it, if you bottle it all up, it may come back. Sure. But sadly, that's what happened to Mike. I know. That's a tragic story. Yeah. Especially all the stuff he did for everybody else, you know, from what I hear. I didn't know the guy, but um, from what you've said and from what other people have talked about, he was a really great dude and he was doing a lot of stuff for everybody else. And sometimes we forget to do stuff for ourselves, you know, so, right. yeah. Well, our brother, like I said, I can't thank you enough for coming on to share and I really do appreciate it. I know it's cathartic for you and for other people. So, yeah, I really appreciate it. And it was good talking to you. Good, good uh, catching up, man. It's been a while right. since I've seen you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Again, th thanks a lot for having me and – uh and I, I really do hope that not just my story, but I'm just one out of many, but all these stories um, get a lot, the exposure that they actually need, needs to. For because sure. Because this is actually a great thing you're doing. And I really do thank you again for it. Not at all. It's my pleasure. I, I love doing it. All right, bro. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch. I'll talk to you soon. We'll do. Take all care. Right.